So a very good afternoon to you all on behalf of BLK Center for Child Health and IAP Central Delhi branch. I, Dr. Swati, welcome you all to this monthly BLK Telepeds webinar. And uh, today's topic is adolescent granny issues uh, case-based discussion. Adolescence is a special period where there is growth as well as maturation and the issues are also unique in this period. And many times parents are at loss, whom to consult, whom to be the right person to address those issues. So that is why we thought of bringing together this topic. To moderate this panel discussion, we have Dr. Shikha Mahajan. She is Associate Director, Pediatrics, Center for Child Health at BLK Max Super Specialty Hospital. Ma'am is an adolescent health specialist as well as national facilitator for adolescent health. She is also national ALS instructor. And on the panel, we have Dr. Alka Sina. Ma'am is Director of Gynecology, Head of Laparoscopy Unit at BLK Max Hospital, Delhi. She is also Co-Director, Endoscopy Training Center at BLK Max Hospital. And her area of special interest is gynecological endoscopic surgery. And she's also involved in training of gynecologists in laparoscopic and hysteroscopic surgeries. She has been faculty at various operative workshops and conferences and authored several publications in international journals and chapters in books. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. And we have uh, Dr. Deepa Pasi. Sorry. Sorry for the glitch. Dr. Deepa Pasi, ma'am, is senior consultant Apollo Hospital, Noida and Delhi. And ma'am has worked a lot in area of adolescent health and she has received, she has been awarded the Academic Achievement Award by Education and Research Foundation for the year 2020 and 2022. She has contributed several chapters in IP, NPH, ICP textbook of adolescent health, contributed chapters for six-month online course in adolescent health, contributed to Indian e-journal for adolescent medicine, and uh, she has been faculty at various international and national conferences. She has authored a book on substance abuse, Emerging Demon, which was released at Pedicon 2022. And she is presently president of EHA Delhi 2024 and executive board IAP Women's Wing Media. Welcome, Dr. Deepa Ma'am. And we have Dr. Smita Ramachandran. She is senior consultant pediatric and adolescent endocrinologist at Venkateshwar Hospital Dwarka as well as BLK Max Hospital. She has co-authored book on pediatric endocrinology and uh, contributed to several publications in national and international journals. So welcome, Dr. Smita. I'll now stop sharing my slides. Over to you, Shikha. You can, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome all my panelists, Dr. Alka Sinha, Dr. Deepa Pasi, and Dr. Smita Ramachandran. Uh, we are here. Thank you, Swati, for a brief introduction. We are here today uh, with uh, something which is a little unusual uh, to discuss, but very important for uh, basically general pediatricians and family physicians. Because uh, pediatricians and family physicians probably are the first ones who come in contact with adolescents, and they are the ones who should be able to uh, diagnose things and refer it to the concerned person at an appropriate time. So we start with the first, we'll be uh, there are a lot of uh, issues in adolescent gynae and it is not possible to discuss all of them. We have just taken a few and uh, we'll stick to those those three or four issues only. Uh, we start with our first case. This is a 16-year-old girl who came to the OPD with severe pain in lower abdomen during her periods. The pain usually started a day prior to her periods and it lasted for two to three days of the periods. It was severe enough to miss her school and it was associated with nausea and vomiting. The girl had attained menarche at the age of 12 years. Her cycles so far have been regular and the flow was moderate. On history taking, uh, this pain was a non-cyclical pain. I mean, there was no there, there was no pain when there was when there was no period. So it was a no non-cyclical pain. There was no pain during when there was no periods. The girl was not sexually active. 
There was no history of excessive eye discharge or vaginal itching. Physical examination normal. Investigations, uh, very uh, few investigations were done. Uh, CPC and ESR were normal. And ultrasound pelvis had been done, which was normal. Uh, with this history and physical examination, Dr. Deepa, what is the diagnosis and how would you proceed to manage it? Thank you, Dr. Shikha. And at the outset, I'd like to give my extend my thanks to the entire BLK team for giving me this opportunity to be amongst the elite speakers. Well, as you have already mentioned, it is the history, physical examination, and the lab investigations point towards the case of dysmenorrhea. Next slide, please. So dysmenorrhea or painful menstruation is basically the most common gynecological complaint among adolescent girls and young women. It is of two types, primary, with which the menstrual pain occurs with no underlying pelvic pathology. Secondary, in which it occurs with an associated pelvic pathology. Next slide. So there is no pathology in the pelvis and 20% women have significant impairment of quality life. That means there is school absenteeism and there is loss of work activity. Pain, primary dysmenorrhea characteristically begins when adolescents attain ovulatory cycles, usually within 6 to 12 months of menarche and also in ladies, young girls between 15 to 25 years. It is thought to be occurring because of the prostaglandins and the leukoterines, which both of which are basically mediators of inflammation. And the prostaglandins which are released are basically the PGF2 alpha and the PGE2 by the endometrial cells. Now these prostaglandins cause the muscles and the blood vessels of the uterus to contract. So the level of the prostaglandins is very high on the day one of the periods and declines as the bleeding continues and the uterus lining is shed off. So the pain, de pain declines after the first few days of a period. Next slide, please. So pain is generally lower abdomen or as we call it as a pelvic pain, it can radiate to the lower back or the interior thigh. Pain is basically crampy in nature, which usually lasts 48 to 72 hours around the menstrual period and is characteristically worse at the onset of the menses. It is also associated with other systemic symptoms like malaise, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, and generalized fatigue. The abdominal and the pelvic examinations, including speculum examination of the cervix, are performed but are usually unremarkable. Because of the generalized fatigue and all these symptoms, the uh, young adolescent girls also have problem in poor quality sleep, including the disturbance in the sleep onset, the latency in the sleep efficiency. As a result, they go into a state of depression as well as anxiety. The uterine tenderness may be present. Next slide, please. Dr. Deepa, I just wanted to ask, are there features where uh, you will have more dysmenorrhea? I mean, yes. There are certain uh, conditions where the menarche has been achieved before 12 years of age or the age is less than 20 years. The adolescent complains of heavy periods which are lasting more than seven days. If they are uh, to the substance abuse like smoking or if there is a patient, mothers have had dysmenorrhea, nulliparity and depression and anxiety. These are all contributive factors towards uh, young girls coming with dysmenorrhea. That is primary dysmenorrhea. And primary dysmenorrhea is the most common dysmenorrhea in a doctor. Yes, that is the most common thing. And if it is secondary, then most probably there is a pathological cause and that becomes a domain of a gynecologist then. So primary dysmenorrhea is diagnosed uh, basically on our history and maybe physical examination also because I do not know how many times we do a speculum examination in primary dysmenorrhea. We don't do it much often, but if there is a history of a sexually transmitted disease or so, then or there is some vaginal discharge which is odorful and it is causing itching. In that situation, we can do. Okay. Uh, how will you manage primary dysmenorrhea, Dr. Deepa? Basically, the initial evaluation on patients presenting with dysmenorrhea includes medical, gynecological, menstrual, family, and psychosocial history to determine whether the patient has primary or symptoms related suggestive of secondary dysmenorrhea. Now, in primary dysmenorrhea, there is no pathology. Now, the main stay of treatment is pharmacological, 
non pharmacological in the form uh, in the form of uh, you know other uh, treatment so the pharmacological also consists of the non steroidal uh, anti inflammatories and the hormonal now coming to the non uh, steroid anti inflammatory drugs these are ibuprofen naproxen mefenic acid and sometimes paracetamol also works wonder all these medicines basically reduce the prostaglandin and reduce the inflammation the second line of treatment is hormonal in which we can try the monophasic combined oral contraceptive pill and sometimes intrauterine system mirena coil is also effective but this we have to do in consensus with the gynecologist next okay. slide please is there, a, is there a role of starting these insets at the onset of uh, on day one of period i mean we are anticipating we are anticipating that this this girl always has pain during her period no not necessarily you can try the non pharmacological methods like local application of heat water bottles and the heat patch can be used and sometimes transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation and exercise like walking aerobics these all can block the pain good sleep meditation yoga and also if there is uh, the child is into smoking that has to be reduced we should try all these non pharmacological methods first and then go on to the nsaids taken a nsa uh, non steroidal uh, anti inflammatories can be given and if still it is not settling then we can try for the hormonal therapy uh dr alka uh, despite doing all these things the pain still persists yes. i mean it's a significant pain so then what should we do should we listen to you uh so basically what you have to do is that you have to refer to the gynecologist to rule out secondary but there is also some uh, you know role of the alternative therapies like uh, dietary supplements can be given in the form of vitamin b1 and b6 because all of these reduce the anti have the uh, anti inflammatory effect and of course we have to have fish oil and vitamin b can also be given even zinc preparations can be given uh, vitamin e also has a great role and sometimes even methi dana that is fenugreek can be given these all have a little effect on the reducing the inflammation thank you dr deepa but uh, dr alka my question is to you yes. that uh, despite trying all these methods and the girl continues to come to us that okay i have i have done, done this i have done this but the pain still persists so maybe we are missing on to something here Ah uh, yes, ma'am. So, ah, uh, usually, as we discussed, most commonly the cases of dysmenorrhea in adolescents is primary dysmenorrhea. So, ah, uh, we manage according to that. However, a patient who is not improving on medication or who has worsening dysmenorrhea, in these patients, we should consider, ah, uh, you know, other causes also, maybe ah, uh, secondary dysmenorrhea. we should not uh, we have to rule it out so what are the other causes which can lead to uh, dysmenorrhea so mullerian duct anomalies uh, something which is very important in young girls we should rule it out so what can be the causes maybe there is a rudimentary horn uh, on one side which is not communicating so obviously that will lead to severe dysmenorrhea uh, another thing which should lead us to you know suspect a uh, cause rather than a primary dysmenorrhea is a patient who has dysmenorrhea starting before the onset of her period so it starts a few days to a week before her cycle start and which may be persist throughout the period rather than being relieved after the uh, you know first uh, two days of periods as a primary dysmenorrhea would normally so in these cases what else can you suspect so mullerian anomalies as i said other anomaly can be maybe a uh, you know uh by uh, didelphis uterus with a uh, maybe a septum on one side so maybe one side of it is blocked and the other side is uh, patent so the patient will have menorrhea uh, uh, cycles we will not um, you know get a um, sign as we would get in a cryptomenorrhea case so in that uh, such cases also endometriosis even though not likely in young girls but i have come across cases of endometriosis and in endometriosis the problem is that many times even your ultrasound will not give you a diagnosis of endometriosis so it becomes a clinical diagnosis and then you give her start her on combined oral contraceptive pills and and that symptoms have improved and that basically corroborates your diagnosis 
adenomyosis, another thing quite commonly associated with endometriosis, sometimes fibroids, uh, in sexually active adolescents, pelvic inflammatory disease can also lead to, you know, dysmenorrhea. Also, there'll be other symptoms associated with it. So the history and the symptoms will also give you a uh, indication for that. Then other causes can be also non-gynecological causes, which can uh, mimic uh, dysmenorrhea in the sense that maybe it will get worsened during the uh, cycles. Now, another thing, uh, one point you asked a little while back was that in a girl who has severe dysmenorrhea, can we start the NSAIDs at the onset rather than wait for the pain? Yes, we can. Sometimes in patients who say that they have very severe and they, even if they take medicine, it takes a long time for the medicine effect to come. We can tell them to uh, start it uh, with the onset of pain. Like, like we do in migraine, we start uh, the medicine just at the onset of, you know, headache. Uh, they say that even if you start it in primary dysmenorrhea, it does help if you start it at an early, early phase. In severe cases only, ma'am, not in all cases. Not a, not a routine practice. Not a routine yes. and practice. And it should be continued almost uh, for the first two, three days. Then it is very yes. effective. And remember that yes. it has to be taken after meals because it can cause gastric irritation. So this, yes. we should always what, tell the patient. What investigation, Dr. Alka, would you suggest if we are suspecting a secondary dysmenorrhea? Now, basic ultrasound usually works for most patients. Uh, it's only in some cases where the diagnosis is not clear, uh, whether we have done an ultrasound, we have not got any positive findings and still the patient is having pain and we are suspecting. So in those cases, maybe an MRI, but usually ultrasound works for most cases. Okay. Uh, Dr. Um, Deepa had mentioned that we can use intrauterine devices at times in um, adolescent girls who have severe dysmenorrhea. What is your uh, your practice, uh, your uh, you know, clinical uh, practice into it? How many times have you used it? Ma'am, uh, it is definitely an option. However, in our society, it's not something which is accepted easily. So, uh, uh, and maybe um, I wouldn't be using it uh, in an adolescent uh, even once in a year, I think. So it's that uncommon. Very uncommon. Yes. Fine. Thank you, Dr. Deepa and Dr. Alka. For, Thank you, Dr. Uh, for a nice presentation. So basically, uh, we have to uh, we have to understand as uh, pediatricians and as family physicians that. Uh, Dysmenorrhea, yes, it can be treated mainly by non-pharmacological methods. A lot of counseling goes into it. And uh, yes, we can use pharmacological methods also. And primary dysmenorrhea is the commonest uh, thing. Secondary dysmenorrhea is very, very rare in adolescents. And if you're suspecting secondary dysmenorrhea, then that adolescent girl should definitely be referred to a gynecologist for further work. Can I uh, add something now? Just yeah. one as far as the LNG goes, also the thing is we are, uh, that is not as such also our drug of choice because obviously uh, the adolescents, adolescents, they wouldn't have had pregnancies till now. So uh, intrauterine device anyway comes very low down on our, uh, you know, uh, priority treatment for it. That is only in cases who have endometriosis maybe, who have tried other things and have failed. So then only we would start that. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's written in books. So I just wanted to know how much are yeah. we actually using in our clinical practice because uh, it is something which is probably not very acceptable even to married women in, in our country. Yes. They also have a lot of uh, issues with IUDs. So uh, I do not know about adults and young girls who are unmarried and uh, you know, it will become a little difficult for them. Dr. Yes. I would also like to add that we sometimes have to take the consent of the parents also if you're using the oral contraceptives. It's better to inform them but though it is lower on the cards, but still, if we at all we use it, then we have to take inform the parents, the guardians. Thank you. We move on. Move on to our second case. Uh, this is a 15-year-old girl who presented with poor height and weight gain. This poor height and weight gain was noticed from her six years age onwards. The child was not developing secondary sexual char characteristics now. Her scholastic performance was average with no history of acute or chronic illnesses, or the child was not on any medications. Birth history, she was born of a non-consanguine marriage, normal vaginal delivery term. Birth examination was, uh, birth weight was 2.6 kgs. 
Neonatal period un uneventful and physical examination at birth was normal. On physical examination, height was 127 centimeters, which was less than 5.5 standard deviations. Mid parental height is 156 centimeters. So the height of the child is way uh, lower than her mid parental height. Weight is 23 kgs, which is also uh, significantly lower, almost five standard deviations lower than her expected her uh, weight. Upper and lower segment ratio is one with an arm span of 131 centimeters. Blood pressure is normal. Pulse rate is normal with no radiofemoral delay. And SMR staging done, the girl is in stage one. Few investigations were done where hemoglobin was normal, LFT and KFT were normal, blood sugars, calcium profile was normal, thyroid function was normal, LH was 33.4, FSH 120, and estradiol was 5. Bone age was 13 years. With these reports and these findings at this stage, Dr. Smitha, what is your preliminary uh, diagnosis and how would you proceed to investigate it? So thank you, ma'am. So uh, most important in this case, when the child walks into a clinic, so the first most striking thing is she's extremely short. I would have expected this child to fall up earlier because she's faltering more than five SDs. So if you see the growth chart, she's a good 20 centimeters off her target. Uh, see, if you start counting, she's definitely 20 centimeters and more. So I would have expected her to be like picked up earlier for uh, very uh, poor height velocity. The height weight ratios, if you look at, height is definitely more affected than her weight. So her weight for her current height is not bad. So in totality, what I'm trying to say is the height is more affected than weight. Second thing, she's five, 15 years, her tanner stage is one. So there is definitely delayed puberty there. And the bone age again is delayed by two years. Biochemically, what you see is a high LH, a high FSH, rather higher FSH and a low estradiol. So she is like a 15 year old girl with short stature, extreme short stature with delayed puberty and biochemically she has hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So the first on my list for both uh, delayed puberty and short stature would be a karyotype. Ideally what we prefer is a 30 cell evaluation to see karyotype. And in this girl's karyotype, she came back as a 45 XO, which is being, she has a turners. And this child, I would like to say, is classically how a Turner girl you will usually present. If you plot her on the right-hand side, is a Turner growth chart. If you plot her on a Turner graph also, she's just above the fifth centile. So she's very short for a Turner as well. In this graph, the upper lines that you see, the black lines are for the normal population of XX girls without Turner. And the bluer lines below are the Turner graphs from the Turner centiles. So ideally, once you've made a diagnosis of a 45 XO karyotype, uh, the basic first line that you should do is rule out thyroid, which was already done in this case. Uh, rule out celiac because it is a common association. Get an ultrasound abdomen done to reveal kidneys uh, evaluation, uh, ovarian and uterine status to see their sizes. And an echo because these are the most common organs uh, associated clinically with Turner. Then you ask, ma'am, what is the next step that we do? First is establishing a diagnosis. So there are two issues. Uh, first of all, in any case of Diller, this was a Turner. So if there's any child who comes to you with the presentation, the parents saying that puberty is delayed, the first question is, when do you label a child to be delayed? So the scientific definition is absence of any sign of puberty in a child at a chronological age, more than 2 SD, above the mean age of pubertal development in the given population. So what does it translate into clinically? For boys, a testicular volume less than 4 ml at 14 years. And for girls, absence of thalaki, onset of thalaki at 13 years, or no menarche till 16 years, or absence of uh, menarche after onset of thalaki more than 3 years. So if she's had thalaki, and within three years of that, she's not had menarche. That is also defined as delayed puberty. So can you, can you simplify something uh, for boys? I mean, for a general pediatrician in his OPD, uh, in her OPD. Uh, so uh, for girls, uh, it's very easy. You know, absence of telarchy at 13 years or not starting. Boys, ke liye, the one thing that you need is you need an okidometer. Because she, any testicular have... volume, yes. Testicular I, volume. They have it, they're not using it, you know. 
So can there be something more simpler than this? No. This no, is a see, because uh, yes, because pubic hair and axillary uh, hair can be a uh, non variant of uh, puberty also may may or may not indicate pubertal onset. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is, if you do a uh, penile lens measurements, there are normograms to compare it age wise. But the absolute indicator of uh, LH testicular, the pituitary gonadal axis is your testicular volume. So if your testicular volume is less than four, or if your testicular volume is more than four, he still hasn't got his axillary pubic hair, you know he started puberty. <laughs> because testicular volume is single most accurate indicator of onset. So it's very it's important that he should use an orchidometer. <laughs> Or else send to me. I'll measure. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, that is how you define. So uh, delayed puberty can have multiple causes. So common ones is how we go about is First, there are the normal variants. That is, it is not an underlying endocrine pathology. It could be a, a constitutional delay. Constitutional delay, mein, there might be a history, may or may not, in the mother of periods coming late. Hence, the daughter has a similar pattern. It could be because of no reason. A lot of times we don't have a reason. We just, then you have to rule out systemic causes. Any underlying chronic systemic illnesses will also, including psychosocial effects, psychological factors, environmental factors can cause a delay. Uh, of course, the endocrine whole list of endocrine uh, diseases like diabetes, growth hormone deficiencies, hypothyroidism, hyperprolactinemia, and uh, Cushing's all, which we'll be discussing further on. When we come to uh, hypogonadism, it is again classified into two. Hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism is most likely when there is a central cause. The central cause can be congenital due to mutations, um, hyperplasias, adrenal hyperplasias, or uh, monogenic mutations, or it can be acquired. So any child who has a history of a CNS lesion, injury, interventions, radiotherapy, all these children have a risk, are at a higher risk for pubertal dysfunctions. Then, of course, like the case we presented is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. The commonest condition in girls is Turner's. They can also be receptor mutations uh, and acquired cases. In acquired cases, it's mostly hemochromatosis following radiotherapy and chemotherapy. The other causes are a bit more rare. So your LHFSH and your estradiol ratios will help you classify whether it's hypogonadotropic hypogonadism or a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So with this case, when we, we have, have a lot of a lot of reasons, you know. Uh, sorry. So we have a lot of lot of uh, DDs for a delayed puberty, and it is not possible to discuss all of them. But uh, how should we proceed to investigate? So First and foremost is that as a pediatrician or as a family physician, we should, we should identify that okay, there's a delayed puberty, and uh, probably uh, the best thing should be that the child should be referred to a pediatric endocrinologist, and then the pedi pediatric endocrinologist can further work up. So, what investigations would you would you prefer that uh, would you like to get it done in the first go? Mm -hmm. uh, Ma'am, first and foremost, for uh, any physician, pediatrician, endocrinologist, the child coming to you, the easiest is plot a growth chart. Whether it's the height is faltering or the weight is faltering or if nothing is faltering, that itself will guide you to one of the DDs. If the height is more affected, if the height is faltering, there is a higher chance of an endocrine pathology. If the weight is more affected, look for more systemic illnesses or undernutrition, malnutrition, or psycho uh, psychosocial factors. So that itself will give you a clue what you need to work up. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, the whole list of the first line of blood tests would be your CBC, electrolytes, uh, alkaline phosphatase to rule out systemic illness, basically liver function, kidney function, CBC. Then the second, uh, in the same go, we would like to get a basal levels of your LH, FHH, estradiol. LH is a better indicator of pubertal onset Having said so, FSH gives you a clue if you're looking at Turner. If you have a very high FSH, it kind of guides you towards Turner. Another thing of big use uh, that I think by far most of us uh, do is get a bone age done. Get an x-ray left hand and wrist, AP or PA view. A bone age again gives you a good clue. What are you looking at? Is there a delay? Is the bone age appropriate? You know, are there... Um, Markers for turners, you will have a mad lung deformity in turners or, um, you know, 
something else like a growth hormone deficiency or a hypothyroid, you'll have very, very delayed bone ages. So that itself also will give you an idea. Is the child actually having an endocrine pathology or is there like a constitutional delay or what? Then of course, once you've done that, uh, you have your whole set of uh, specific um, blood tests. If you're suspecting growth hormone deficiency, you can do a, a IGF-1 uh, to CNS. If you're suspecting of you have a history or there are neurological symptoms, you can go for an MRI uh, pituitary. Uh, gonadotropin releasing is usually done uh, when you're in very, very specific cases, when you're trying to differentiate between hypo, hypog and CDGP. And of course, if there is a syndromic presentation, we can uh, plan a genetic testing to tell you what is the exact pathology and what outcomes to expect. Thank you, Swetha. That's a long list of investigations that we should go ahead. Uh, so once diagnosed, how do you manage these cases? And do we need to do additionally something more in a Turner syndrome since we discussed Turner's? So, so do we need to uh, ma'am? Turner's is a whole uh, plethora of symptoms and management because it is not a single entity. It has so many components that once you've made a diagnostic of Turner's, it becomes a multidisciplinary approach. It cannot be managed individually by the pediatrician or by the pediatric endocrinologist either. You need to let in all your subspecialties. So for puberty, we start hormone replacement by 10 to 11 years of age in girls. Build it up slowly by a maximum of two years, you build up the maximum dose of estrogen. And then you add pro uh, progesterone uh, by two years or else uh, whenever she starts her menstruation, you add in progesterone at the time. Turner girls uh, additionally need growth hormone because they do not, unless they're very uh, mosaics, even mosaics are short. So EXO always uh, need short uh, growth hormone to augment their height. Sometimes what it becomes difficult is they come to you at an age like 15 years, bone age is 30. So you don't know whether you should, you know, start growth hormone first or should you induce puberty first or together. So the earlier we pick up, optimal is the management for both puberty and height. So beyond endocrine, uh, the Turner, the, I'm quoting the Cincinnati uh, 2016 Turner guidelines here. And the next slide. No, what I wanted to ask was that supposing uh, you uh, diagnose a delayed puberty, obviously a delayed puberty would be diagnosed, uh, say something at about 14 years or 15 years or something like that in girls. Mm -hmm. So that is the time you would start uh, hormonal therapy if it is not, I mean, if it's not Turner's or something. Uh, yes. If it is diagnosed. Uh, see ma'am, by definition, by 13, if there's no thalaki, I do my workup to find out a cause. If I know a cause, I know very likely whether she's going to go have puberty or not. If it is CDGP, you can wait at the age of 13. But like this girl who's at 15 already, it is uh -huh. she's already late by her peer group also. So yeah, you yeah. would like to start once you have an etiology or even if it is idiopathic, you will start. So basically you have to differentiate uh, case to case uh, as to when you would start the hormonal therapy, yes. right? Turner's is a bit challenging because of the extreme short stature they come along with. And the next slide. So this is the follow-up that should be done for Turner's. Uh, they have a lot of associated problems. Like I said, they need a cardiac evaluation, uh, annually cardiac evaluation, renal ultrasound, uh, ophthalmological dental evaluation should be done every three to five years. Celiac, hypothyroidism, HB1Cs, um, glucose intolerance scale should be done annually. Additionally, their bone evaluation for scoliosis, uh, kyphosis, um, hip dislocations, all this, and bone mineral density. This should be also done at least annually. Uh, the bone mineral density does not need to be done annually, anytime once, and depending upon the outcomes and interventions that you, maybe every five years. But this is the whole range, uh, the list of follow-ups that need to be. So like I said, it becomes a multidisciplinary approach for turners. A lot of them get uh, positive for celiac also. I have them. So there are who are hypothyroid and celiac Turner girls. How many how many cases of Turner's do you see in a year? Uh, not too many, but ma'am, uh, three to five easily I get Turner's in a year. And a lot of times they get referred for, um, you know, not the puberty, indigestion, uh, rickets. I have like two of the times I picked up is because referred from an orthopedician for rickets. He lay a treated rickets, she's not responding. Why? She had celiac. And she turned out to be a turner. 
Okay, but so, short stature was always there. Significant short was always there, but uh, till seven, eight years, they don't really bother the parents. Catch up, ho jayega, the tendency she'll catch up, catch up. They get connecting, it's tangy teddy, ho rahi hai, yeah, leg pains, or whatever. So, uh, in fact, two of the both the kids I have diagnosed the, this year have been last year were references from orthopedicians because not responding resistant rickets karke ki ye theek nahi ho rahi hai. Dr. Alka, what is your experience in delayed puberty? You get some cases or uh, normally they go to the endocrinologist? No, ma'am. A lot of patients come to us. And uh, so one thing is nowadays we have started taking a cutoff of 15 years for primary amenorrhea instead of the 16 which we used to do. And the second uh, thing, uh, second difference is that previously we used to build up the estrogen very slowly. Nowadays, we start with uh, significant doses of estrogen and obviously we do increase, but uh, we do not uh, increase. Uh, we used to increase very gradually previously. So nowadays we do start in a few months only we reach maximum doses of estrogen. Monitor them according uh, to the clinical, obviously, picture and also with ultrasound, how the infantile uterus is growing. And then as Dr. Smitha explained, add progesterone. So that is one thing. And we do get patients, they do come for amenorrhea. It's not uh, that uncommon, maybe because we cater to uh, urban population. Maybe it is less in uh, uh, rural and all. In Ames and all, we used to get patients very late. So okay. in our population, we do not get very late cases. But still, yes, uh, it is not that uh, they come very early. They come at 15, 16 with amenorrhea and short height. So uh, we do these see these cases because as pediatricians we do not see many cases coming with uh, basically coming with primary amenorrhea. Okay, uh, I mean I don't remember uh, seeing many cases who have just come lately. I got a girl last year, last year, and uh, she had not attained her her uh, secondary sexual characters till the age of about seventeen years. They were again staying in a rural area, and from there the girl was uh, brought here to Delhi. And um, I remember I referred uh, that child to uh, Dr. Swati, Swati Kanodia, about last year. <clears throat> I don't know, but it did not turn out to be turned on So, I we think do... technologist must be the person who would be getting from everywhere. Like, when we also see, we also take the endocrinologist into loop. So, so basically, um, thank you, Dr. Smitha and Dr. Alka. Uh, so, when we have delayed puberty, uh, as pediatricians, I think we need to involve our uh, pediatric endocrinologist and our uh, pediatric uh, 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 gynecologist who is who is more uh, tuned to uh, you know seeing adolescents. So some adolescent gynecologist we need to involve. So this is what is the message for all of us that first and foremost we need to start using an orchidometer in our uh, practice, start charting the growth charts in all patients. Well, that's a very simple thing to do. And I think we all have been doing it for last many years. Um, at least I have been using a growth chart in every patient so far I've ever seen. So uh, sure. these basic... Can I add in, uh, Dr. Shikha, that we should uh, also do the sexual maturation rating also, tenor staging should also be done simultaneously. Because uh -huh. when they come for well baby clinics, so for vaccination, that is the opportune time to do all the growth charting, weight, height, BP, everything should be taken up at that time. Exactly. So these are very uh, a, a thorough physical examination by the by the primary uh, you know physician, the pediatrician or the family physician probably will will identify these issues at an early stage and uh, the the therapy also would be more effective and the results also would be more rewarding for all of us. Uh, thank you. We move on to our last case. Um, This is again a 15 year old girl who presented with complaints of amenorrhea for four months. This was followed by continuous bleeding for last 15 days. The previous cycles were irregular since menarche, but irregularity has increased for last uh, almost three months. And every one to three months she is having bleeding. And sometimes the bleeding is very heavy. Menarche she attained four years back at the age of 11 years. On physical examination, her height is 5 feet, weight is 68 kgs. The BMI is 29.5 and the modified ferrimin galvis score is 8. There is presence of acanthosis nigricans. nigricans. Uh, 
Uh, with these uh, findings, Dr. Alka, what is your primary interpretation at this stage? And how would you like to proceed? So ma'am, based on the history and the examination, most probably this is a case of polycystic ovarian syndrome in a uh, overweight uh, young girl. So I would, uh, based on this diagnosis, I would like to investigate her uh, for PCOS. And also, since she has bleeding for the last 15 days, there is an element of abnormal uterine bleeding also. So uh, even though I would not require an ultrasound for the diagnosis of PCOS in an adolescent, however, because of this bleeding, I'll also like an ultrasound. So the investigations would be a complete blood profile, a thyroid evaluation, a prolactin, a testosterone total and pre-testosterone if we have it or the pre-testosterone we can estimate by the free androgen index. A oral glucose tolerance test should be done for a patient. Insulin fasting is actually not necessary to get it done, but we do get it done in our clinical practice, especially for obese girls. Uh, a lipid profile should always be done. So this is based on a diagnosis of uh, PCOS. So in this patient, um, as we can see, uh, most of the investigations are within normal limits except that the endometrial thickness is more. So she's having some degree of endometrial hyperplasia in this patient because of the preceding uh, period of amenorrhea. Now, in those cases where I feel that the hirsutism or hyperandrogenism is very severe, where I want to rule out the other differential diagnosis of a uh, uh, non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia or a Cushing's or some androgen secreting tumor. In those cases, uh, especially if the testosterone level comes to be quite significantly high, more than 200 and all, in those cases also, I would like maybe a 17 OHP and a cortisol. So that also we can do. So you think... So, you uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am? No, no, carry on. So uh, nowadays, uh, we diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome based on the modified uh, Rotterdam classification. And uh, this has changed over time from uh, the NIH criteria, which was used previously. So at present, we use the revised consensus Rotterdam criteria, as I told you. And in adolescence, this requires the presence of both clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism and evidence of ovulatory dysfunction or chronic anovulation. In ultrasound is not used because ultrasound picture is not, uh, you know, there are no definitive criteria uh, for the ultrasound picture to define PCOS in adolescents. So as opposed to ad adults in whom that is the third criteria. So one, two out of three should be present in adults where we take ultrasound picture of the follicle number per cross section, which is if it is more than 10, it is suggestive of PCOS or the fo follicle number per ovary, more than 20, which is suggestive of PCOS or the ovarian volume more than 10 ml. However, we do not use these uh, features uh, in PCOS and we should not use ultrasound to diagnose PCOS. Serum AMH also, serum AMH, high serum AMH is also one of the diagnostic factors to be used in adults. However, it should not be used in adolescents. So basically, hyperandrogenism and ovulatory dysfunction. These are the two uh, features we use. Now, how do we define ovulatory dysfunction? So as we all know, when periods start after menarche, irregular periods are very common. It is normal in the first uh, year. So uh, first year, we shouldn't really bother. In the second year, that is one year to less than three years post-menarche, the normal period duration is 21 days to 45 days. So anything less than that or more than uh, 45 is abnormal. After three years of menarche, the cycle should be 21 to 35 days. So anything more than 35 days or less than eight cycles per year is considered to be a sign of 
ovulatory dysfunction or any one cycle which is more than 90 days in duration is again a sign of ovulatory dysfunction and as we just dr smitha just discussed primary amenorrhea is defined as uh, no periods by the age of 15 years or more than three years post thalarchy what exactly do you mean by one year post menarche more than 90 days for any one cycle ma'am uh, so as i said in the first year she can have 90 days, 120 days, 6 months, 5 months amenorrhea. It doesn't matter. But after 1 year, if she has a amenorrhea of 3 months, that is considered to be significant. So, ma'am, what happens in PCOS patients is that the basic problem is insulin resistance, which further leads to androgen excess and uh, hyperandrogenism. And um, so uh, these two uh, factors are very important. Obviously, obesity, genetic predisposition, all these also play a role. And uh, obesity and insulin resistance further are interrelated. So in these patients, uh, we have uh, features of severe acne and hirsutism in adults, in, in adolescents. In adults also, we will have, apart from acne and hirsutism, a uh, female pattern baldness also but in these patients um, uh, teenagers acne and hirsutism are very important features and whenever we see this we actually do not need to go and do actually biochemical tests even clinical picture is good enough uh, previously we used to think that a, a modified ferriman galway score of eight is considered to be hirsutism but nowadays the cutoff has decreased and in adolescents even uh, adolescents or even adults when we consider PCOS even a four to six score is considered significant enough could you, could you then, just, uh, could you just uh, elaborate a little about this ferriman galvis score so mm -hmm. uh, this scoring is done on nine areas of the body uh, which is the upper lip uh, the beard area uh, the chest upper abdomen lower abdomen upper back lower back, arms, and thighs. So on these areas, the um, uh, the hair growth is scored on a, a score of zero to four in each area. And uh, traditionally, we used to think that anything more than eight is considered hirsutism. So uh, this is how we score it. Uh, so the important thing is that whenever we find that and there is any new onset severe hirsutism, or any worsening hirsutism. This is the time when we need to do all those tests which we discussed previously to rule out androgen secreting tumors. Also, uh, if we find that we have done the test and uh, the testosterone has come normal, then we can do DHEAS and androstenedione. Otherwise, if the testosterone is the one basic test which we need to do. How do you manage such adolescents, Dr. Alka? So uh, for these adolescents, uh, we have to consider management of the symptoms as well as management of their uh, health, physical health, reproductive health. So we have certain short-term goals and we have long-term goals. Short-term goals will be regulation of the menstruation, uh, control of hirsutism, reduction of weight, taking care of their psychological issues. Obviously, this would even translate into long-term health. The long-term goals would be uh, basically to ensure, uh, uh, to take care of those aspects which are not actually relevant now, like cardiovascular disease, metabolic uh, risk factors, diabetes. All these things are not relevant now, but patient, uh, PCOS uh, cases have a uh, uh, risk factor of the have a risk of developing diabetes later on in life cardiovascular disease endometrial hyperplasia due to the chronic anovulation uh, also they have infertility issues so it is our aim is to optimize these uh, factors also so think, first would be i think these long-term goals are probably more important because as an adolescent the adolescent would not uh, realize the importance of these things because that time it is the body image and the physical appearance which is you know which is more important to them but the long-term uh, issues which they may have 
or so these a good counseling is needed uh, whenever we are dealing with the dolphin pcos yes ma'am so it is very important we get a um, you know opportunity to deal with all these things uh, but it is very important that whenever we discuss these things we have to be very sensitive and empathetic we have to deal with a lot of empathy we should uh, first of all uh, we should not we definitely have to tell them the importance of weight and you know its negative correlation with health but we should be very sensitive when dealing with these things calling uh, you know telling a patient about ob obesity and overweight so uh, it's better to you know maybe use gentler terms that you know some degree of uh, extra weight or something like that and we should tell obviously parents also have to be in the loop so that you know the proper counseling uh, goes through and the message goes through but yes it is an opportunity to take care of all these uh, long term issues uh, so important thing is non pharmacological measures which are very important so i tell patients basically uh, this is the actual treatment the pharmacological treatment is more of a symptom based treatment the non pharmacological measures and a healthy lifestyle is what is the actual treatment for pcos i mean this is a way to explain to them the gravity of the situation and the importance of diet and exercise so uh, coming to diet and exercise there's no one diet one specific diet which helps any healthy balanced diet actually helps so we cannot uh, you know recommend one diet on uh, over any other diet coming to exercise lifestyle intervention uh, as we discussed is very important and basically forms one of the cornerstones of therapy adolescents specifically should aim for at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day including activities that strengthen muscle and bone uh, three times per week this is a recommendation as per eshre the european society uh psychological counseling as we discussed very important we should definitely screen for depression which is a much more common symptom in adolescents as compared to adults where both depression and anxiety is seen in pcos patients uh pcos can also uh, affect their uh, sexual function so that is another thing which should be assessed coming to the pharmacological management so here it is the management is dependent on what is the primary complaint of the patient so as we can see in this patient menstrual irregularity is a complaint the combined oral contraceptive pill is the first line treatment for this patient also she has some element of abnormal uterine bleeding that could be related to the uh, endometrial hyperplasia as we discussed along with uh, the chronic anovulation so anyway what is important in this case is we start her oral uh, contraceptives that will help even in control of the bleeding also so uh, uh, metformin alone can also be used but it is not that good and obviously in adolescents we think twice before starting uh, metformin so a combined oral contraceptive would be the first choice for her she also has a issue of hirsutism which is again taken care by the combined oral contraceptive now which combined oral contraceptive to use a low dose combined oral contraceptive which has less than 30 micrograms of ethanol estradiol along with the fourth generation progesterone so dinogest uh, should uh, work quite well uh, for hirsutism there are also other options like laser therapy and photoepilation which will help only in a patient who has taken medicines for 6 months and is still troubled by hirsutism we can give antiandrogens and in antiandrogens spironolactone would be the first line uh, choice so uh, all these patients may also have some element of uh, obesity or insulin resistance so in these patients metformin can be given as per the indication uh metformin uh use again i'd like to add one thing so it has gone through a cycle we started using metformin for everything and anything nowadays we are uh, quite um, uh, choosy so you start metformin only when there is an indication to do so okay. so i think yeah i think uh, you you've covered it pretty well uh my there were one or two questions to dr smita 
Dr. Smita, uh, do we need to be watchful for PCOS only in obese uh, adolescents or it can present in a lean adolescent too? Uh, so ma'am, in our setup as pediatricians, there are two sets of children we should be watchful. A, to answer yours, lean PCOS is a fact now. Earlier, it was considered only when the child is obese, has acanthosis, and the general mindset of the people is also, if she's overweight, it is PCOS. But uh, lean PCOS is also there. Uh, it is not related to the adiposity. So girls who are thin have also been documented to have high insulin resistance leading to PCOS. So they also need to be uh, monitored and worked up and with a higher index of suspicion. Why? This would present uh, with the rest of the same features. With the same, yes. The diagnosis yes. is the same. A higher of in index of suspicion because um, we are looking at non-obese also. So we have to remember that uh, metformin might work for them also because the underlying pathology is also there is high level of insulin resistance because insulin resistance is not related to adiposity. Okay. Second thing, ma'am, one more thing is one thing that we as pediatricians where we'll have first contact, babies, girls who are born SGA because mm -hmm. of the intrauterine axis disruption have per se an increased risk of developing PCOS later. We have to tell them to avoid because there is a tendency to overcompensate in terms of overfeeding the babies and they become overweight during their childhood. We have to enforce this in the parents. So every child SGA who walks into my clinic gets this information that excessive weight gain during childhood is an increased risk factor for PCOS later. These children are prone to pubertal problems and PCOS. So lifestyle modification should be initiated and, um, you know, reinforced during childhood itself. So that when they're adolescents, we may have a lower level of uh, difficulties of metabolic syndrome in them. So these are the two populations in the pediatric age group we should be, uh, you know, counseling them. So SGA babies and uh, lean adolescents. Uh, so Dr. I'm just to add to that, ma'am, one point, basically, that as Dr. Smitha said, lean PCOS is becoming more and more uh, frequent now. We encounter it more frequently now also. Uh, so it is important in these cases also to stress the fact of lifestyle effect of uh, lifestyle modification because it is not just to reduce weight. It is for the insulin resistance also. Dr. Alka, how long do we need to give OCPs in uh, in PCOD? And uh, once we stop OCPs, Will the cycles again become irregular or we need to continue at lifetime? You know? So we can give uh, OCPs for 6 to 12 months initially. And what we expect is during this time, what all the non-pharmacological uh, you know, interventions would have also uh, done their work. And if the patient follows a healthy lifestyle, uh, it uh, she might maintain a long period of time when she does not require any treatment. Okay. Uh, another question to you is how many adolescent uh, PCOS present with infertility when they, you know, when they come to a marriageable age or uh, the uh, childbearing age? So uh, they are, uh, as we are seeing increasing cases of PCOS, definitely we are cases, uh, we are also seeing increasing cases of infertility in whom the cause, uh, causative factor is the chronic annihilation of PCOS itself. We do see these cases, uh, but it is important to stress that not all PCOS patients have infertility. A lot of them manage to have a uh, normal reproductive life. And are we overdiagnosing PCOS both with both to Dr. Smith and Dr. Yes, Smith. yes, we are. Yes, we are. I get patients every day with an ultrasound picture of polycystic ovarian morphology, and they have been started on uh, metformin. They have been uh, told about all the adverse, uh, you know, uh, correlations uh, of uh, PCOS, and they are all taking uh, some medicine or the other. Uh, yes, ma'am. Adolescents. First thing should not be not to jump on PCOS the moment they say there's a period yes. irregularity. It is just an immature axis which is going to take time to mature. So give them time. There, is a there are a lot of girls who walk in saying we, we have PCOS. They are convinced they have PCOS. Either they've Googled or been told by some somebody, some treating physician. So they're convinced they're PCOS. So they're surprised when I say not to start anything. 
you know you have to convince them lifestyle modification is something in fact much before pharmacological therapies which will come into play and have better effects in these kids thank you dr smitha and dr alka for a wonderful uh, interaction about pcos uh so for adolescents uh who uh, who have features of pcos but do not meet any diagnostic criteria an increased risk should be considered and a reassessment is advised on or before full reproductive maturity 8 years post menarche so, so in these can yeah. start combined oral contraceptive pills if, uh, if we have a strong suspicion of pcos uh if she has features of hirsutism and all the other investigations have turned out normal so we can start basing uh, uh, uh saying that she's an increased risk of pcos we can give her treatment we can tell her about all these lifestyle modification and all but we should definitely keep them on watch and reassess them later so uh to just to summarize it's important that we do not miss the diagnosis of pcos in adolescent girls as timely intervention can prevent a lot of morbidity pediatricians family physicians dermatologists who take care of adolescents they must be well aware of this condition for diagnosis and early referral any girl with acne obesity hirsutism and menstrual abnormalities should be screened for pcos any uh, adolescent with signs of insulin resistance and associated metabolic syndrome should be uh, watched for pcos uh with this we pre we when we end all our cases and uh, dr swati um i hand over the screen to you and uh, we are open for any questions dr yeah. swati thank you ma'am so uh thank i thank dr shikha and all the panelists for discussing in depth these uh, common gynecological issues in adolescents and uh, we have few questions in the chat box dr arun dugal has asked uh, is obesity associated with increased incidence of dysmenorrhea although dr please i had already written a reply to him yes it is definitely associated with the uh, uh, dysmenorrhea because they achieve sometimes early menarche as well so that is also one of the reasons for the child with obesity or adolescent with obesity to have dysmenorrhea Okay, another question by Dr. Arun Dugal again. Does PCOS have a genetic predisposition, Dr. Smitha? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, it yes. Has. It can because insulin resistance can be familial and inherited. So that itself is the underlying pathology for a lot of times for PCOS. So yes, it can have. Do we have any more questions, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Swati? no ma'am uh, i would like to ask dr smita with this obesity pandemic do you also see uh, how common is precocious puberty early menarche in girls yes so um, precocious puberty yes now it is coming up that obesity is a precursor it can enhance why what obesity done itself is in itself it increases your bone age so the growth is faster and it is a risk factor for early puberty we are seeing a lot of uh, children who the demographic is shifting towards early thalopy and a lot of time interventions are being done because they are very precocious because anything beyond before 8 years is precocity and a lot of them are obese but is it a cause effect relation uh, the data is not available but the association is very very clear somebody has just now asked a question other than pcos what are the other problems most commonly encountered in adolescents well it's a vast a huge vast topic so vast question mental health issues can be there but uh, maybe i think that their uh, question is mainly to adolescent gynae yeah. dr alka what else do we see in adolescent gynae do we see sexually transmitted diseases uh yes. not so much not so much of uh, sexually transmitted diseases but yes apart from pcos uh, common uh, things are uh, you know may they come with uh, discharge they come with the need of emergency contraception nowadays a lot they sometimes even come for medical terminations of pregnancy uh, dysmenorrhea is one of the commonest things we see adolescents with mm -hmm. um, do you see uh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding also the ubs dysfunctional yes. uterine bleeding is not very common but yes it is there i recently had a patient a young girl who had uh severe bleeding and she had been treated at so many different places she came with her endometrial thickness of 34 mm 
on hysteroscopy, the endometrium was full of, you know, necrotic and destabilized uh, products. So she must have been having progesterone off and on, off and on. So mm -hmm. uh, DUB, yes, we do get cases. Not very common. More common is dysmenorrhea, much more common. But yes, we do get cases. Uh, Ma'am, what I would like to say, one interesting thing that I've seen in a couple of years is gender dysphoria in adolescents now. Girls. So this is not something we should jump upon. And the second thing is, this is not something that we should completely rule out. So if such a child presents to you, there's a lot of tendency to say, Nahi, ye ho jayegi. the parents feel it's a disease, there is a pathology. Get the pathological test if you want to, but don't say it is wrong or don't overrule it as a phase in front of the child. What yes. the child who is going through is very real to them. So this have been off and on, not very many, but I have been seeing in the past two, three years, gender dysphoria in adolescents. I've seen girls. Since the time they've opened many. up, they have coming forward with all these problems. Yes, they're probably coming up more. Ah. They're, uh, the exposure they were existing, more. but uh, now they're quite yes. open about The awareness is more, yes. Maybe initially it was associated with a lot of stigma, so they... Yes. Anyway, yes. The acceptance is more now. I think the awareness is more. Yeah, Dr. Swati has commented that uh, I feel puberty counseling to be done. So uh, your I think puberty counseling is something which should be a part of the school curriculum baseline for every person. I mean you you know not or every child at every time at or pre-puberty will come to a doctor. But at an even age group, if it is implemented in the school curriculum, that the coverage is much, much more. You know, so I think it, that is the right place to advise people. Bring their, uh, bring their girls. The moment, you know, uh, like my patients who have been, I've been following since birth and they say that we want to come and meet you because she started her periods. Okay, So it's like, it's like a bolt of the blue which comes to them. And they come and the mother is more worried than the girl. That's what I feel. Because I tell the mother that I'm sure she must have attended some sessions in her school about it and she's probably aware about it. No, no, nobody has talked about it to her nobody knows anything about it and all that so i think uh, many times our parents also need to become mothers also need to be counseled that you know what is normal and what is not normal and how she has to deal with her uh, with her adolescent who has just started her menarche so those things have to I be i think the information should be imparted before they have menarche so they are not taken by you know shock so that is the time whenever they come for their vaccinations around eight, nine years, whenever they come for regular checkup or so, we should prime the child as well as the mother for that matter. Exactly. Even for boys also? Mother, yes, definitely. Definitely. Not only for girls, I'm sure for boys no, too. For both. Need to be, you know, need to be primed because fathers hardly uh, take part. They in don't it. interact yeah. with their sons mostly. So mothers need to. Uh. Dr. Swati, should we wind up? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So there are no more questions and uh, we have come towards the end of this session. I mm -hmm. thank you our extremely elite faculty for uh, sharing in depth such a difficult topic and sharing their expertise. Uh, thank you to all the participants mm -hmm. and those who could not attend. We will be posting the recording of this session on the blkpediatricpractice.com website and we will also share mm -hmm. the link. And uh, next month we will come back with another interesting topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for kindness for a wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Sparky. Thank you, everyone.